All right, first video time. You're gonna see me switch back and forth between screen screens. Hopefully it's not too confusing for you guys. Uh, I hope that this whole process is gonna be nice and easy for you. So first off, you can see that I have a wonderful little uh, do now here for you. If we were in class, you would do this at the beginning of class, but just do this as like a, a, a warm up, if you will. Uh, just pause the video, try it out, and right about now, I'm gonna put up on my screen my doc cam so you guys can actually see the answers. If you can't understand how to do any of these, well, you should know how to use function notation. It's not too difficult, just plug in two uh, to each of those uh, functions. We call it direct substitution. But over here, uh, obviously, you have to factor the numerator and denominator and cross out any common factors to get it simplified. All right, so there are your answers, and let's proceed to. Chapter two, rates of change and limits. <laughs> so this first thing that we have here is just kind of like a, a real quick example, hopefully a really quick example, to show you uh, what we, one purpose to having a limit. You guys heard about limits last year. It was our last, uh, last section in the, uh, uh, the distance learning that we had to do. So first example we have here. Suppose you drive 200 miles and it takes you four hours. Your average speed, I hope you all can figure out that it's going to be 50 miles an hour. And we do that by just doing 200 miles divided by four hours. If you don't know that formula yet, it is a formula. You should know that by now. Average speed, again, is equal to the total distance divided by the elapsed time. You can also memorize this as delta x divided by delta t. Greek letter right here, it's called delta. It means change in. In this case, x is the position of the car, so it's the change in the position of the car, also known as the distance, divided by the change in time. So delta x divided by delta t, all right? One other way that you could do this, well, actually two other ways that you could, could do this, you could do x2 minus x1 over t2 minus T1, all right? So that's another option that you have here. And this should look exactly like the slope formula that you guys know and love. It's a little bit different though, just in that in this particular setup, we have X as our dependent variable and T, the time, as our independent variable, all right? So we know that if we drive 200 miles in four hours, our average speed is 50 miles per hour. But nobody in the right mind would say that that means that they were driving 50 miles an hour. Because sometimes you drive faster, sometimes you drive slower. Again, 50 miles per hour is what is our average speed. The speed that we go at any particular instant along the trip is called our instantaneous speed. All right. So if you look at your speedometer at some point and you notice that you're going 65 miles per hour, that is your instantaneous speed. It's not the speed that you travel for five seconds. It's not the speed that you travel for one second. It's the speed that you travel for, oops, one instant, right? So for lack of a better term, uh, instantaneous speed, the speed at one instant. Let's put this in a, another context. Let's say a rock falls from a high place. Let's say I take a rock. No, it's not that interesting. Let's fix this. Instead of a rock, a kitten is going to fall out of my window. I go to that window right there, and I drop a kitten out of that window. I want to know how fast is that kitten traveling when it hits the ground. Why do I want to know that? I want to know how big the is when it hits the ground, right? So in order to figure that out, one way that I can do this, and this is a bad way to do this, but you can do it this way, the position of the kitten is given by this equation right here, where the y is the distance that the kitten has fallen, <clears throat> and t is the amount of time that it's taken to fall that, uh, that much. Let's say that I know that the kitten's gonna fall for two seconds before it hits the pavement down below. So that means if I plug in two for t, I'm going to, the kitten is going to have moved 64 feet. So calculating the average speed, now let's not do it that way. Let's do it this way. We'll call it v sub a v e for average velocity. The average speed that the kitten travels at is going to be y of 
2, the amount of time at the end, minus y of 0, the amount of time at the beginning, over 2 minus 0. And the y of 2 is just going to be, looking over here, y of 2 is 16 times 2 squared, which is going to be equal to the 64 minus uh, y of 0. I plug in 0 for t right here, and I should get 0 off of that, divided by 2 minus 0, which leads us into this formula for our average speed. Now, if we know that the kitten is traveling at an average of 32 feet per second, does that really help us when we want to know how fast the kitten is traveling when it hits the ground? Absolutely not, because over the entire travel down to the ground, he's traveling on average at 32 feet per second. But if you know how gravity works, we have something called acceleration due to gravity. So he's going faster as he gets closer and closer to the ground. As more time passes, the kitten travels faster and faster. So what we have to do, we have to calculate the instantaneous speed. Ah, yes, what is the instantaneous speed at two seconds? And in order to find the instantaneous speed, let's just call that V sub inst, I would have to do y of 2 minus y of 2 divided by 2 minus 2, which is not good. That, that's really bad for us to do because if I was to take y of 2, that's the same number as y of 2, so I get number minus itself is going to equal 0 divided by 2 minus 2 is 0. What we have here, if you uh, had me in the springtime, you will hopefully in the term, remember this term. Zero divided by zero is something called an indeterminate form. And zero divided by zero, I know you guys have learned in the past that uh, you can't divide by zero. Well, you, you can. Certain things happen when you divide by zero. In this case, you can get literally any number out of zero divided by zero. You can get 10, 4, any number is going to work. So instead of doing it this way, where we have y of 2 minus y of 2, what we have to do, our first 2 here is going to have to be 2 with a little distance added to it. We're going to do that same thing down here. So now these twos are going to cancel out, and we're left with this formula. Delta y over delta t is going to be equal to 16 times the quantity of 2 plus h squared minus 16 times 2 squared, all over h. And just to show you guys what I'm talking about, I, did, I just took this expression and used my, uh, used my function notation to evaluate 16t squared, but instead of t, I'm plugging in 2 plus h, all right? So now we have a couple of different options on how we want to, uh, oh, sorry, no, we don't have a couple of options on how to evaluate this. We actually have to talk about some stuff. We have to talk about how big we want h to be. We want our delta t to essentially be as small as possible. We want tiny. We want that as tiny as possible. So we want h to be unbelievably small. And you all should know what the smallest number possible is. The smallest po number possible is going to be zero. Essentially, we want h to be zero. But if we make h zero, we're still gonna run into that zero divided by zero problem. So what we have to do is we have to approximate when h is really close to zero. That's step one up here, where we're gonna estimate this value if h is close to zero. Step two is going to be the better way to do it. When we do this algebraically, anytime you can do things algebraically, you're going to get a dead-on exact answer. So I'm going to show you how to do this uh, graphically and numerically, and then we're going to try it uh, <clears throat> algebraically, right? So in order to do this graphically, I hope you guys know what tool you have that allows you to do things graphically. Ah, uh, yeah, this guy right here. My TI-84 is a little bit off. There we go. I think you guys can see that a little bit better now, can't you? 
All right, and what you can see here is uh, in my first, in my Y1, I have actually stored uh, the expression that's on my board behind me. And you'll probably notice that, uh, that the, the H that I have in my expression on the board, I've replaced it in my calculator with X's, right? So it's 16 times quantity of 2 plus x squared minus 16 times 2 squared all over x. Because your calculator is a dum dumb and it doesn't understand when you use an h in it. All right? So you just have to go to what it understands. So now to estimate this graphically, I'm just going to look at a graph. And I'm going to try to, I'm just, gonna, just, just going to try to figure out what the function value is, the y value is, when x is really close to when we wanted h to be 0. Right? So I want to figure out what is the height of the function when the lefty righty of the function is at zero. And if I go to graph, I can actually see where h, really in this case we're talking about x, is zero. That's the y axis. I want to, I want to figure out how high this blue line is at x equals zero. See how it goes way up? It's way off my screen. So I need to adjust my window. Looking at my window, I know that. Uh, I'm talking about x being 0, so let's just make this a little bit more centralized. We'll make our window go from negative 1 to positive 1. And uh, you mess around with the y min and y max until you can get it dead on. I happen to know what the answer is, so we're going to set y min at 60, y max at 70. You can get that by playing around. And now I hit graph, and I can see this graph. And it looks like there's, if you have the TI-84 plus CE, it looks like there's actually a hole right at x equals 0. And I can estimate, it looks it's like it's right on that integer. And when we're doing this graphically, you're going to be doing some estimating, so it might be wrong, but whatever. We started at 60, so 60, 61, 62, 63, 64. I'm going to guess graphically that it looks like this value is 64 feet per second for the kitten hitting the ground, which is twice the average speed. We can also do this numerically. To do this numerically, you just have to plug into the function some number that's really close to zero. A couple ways you can do that. You can go to trace, a number that's really close to zero, point zero 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 one. Right? You can see when I'm at 1 times 10 to the negative 7, I'm at 64. Right? And technically, you may remember this from last year. You would want to do from both sides a negative point zero 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 one. And boom, very close to 64 as well. Right. Other ways that we can do this, you can go on the home screen and you can use your VARES menu using the function notation to get the VARES menu. If you have a TI-84, alpha, trace, and then you can just pull up Y1 and literally type in your function notation. Boom. The way that I like to do this, I like to use my table in order to do this. And if you hit second graph and get into your table, you probably have numbers pre-populated in here. To get your, your table into a much more powerful table, you can hit second window, go to table set, change your independent over to ask. And then when you go into table, you're gonna have like nothing in there. That's because you haven't asked it to do any calculations yet. So you can just plug in 0.0001. Okay, it's a little bit more so it gives it up. And gives us 64. I didn't feel like figuring out what 400,001 divided by 6,250 was. And doing it from the other side, negative 0.000001. Yeah, 64. Yeah, okay. So looking at the graph, that's graphical. Plugging it into trace or using the table, that's numerical. Both really bad ways to do it because uh, I don't know if you remembered when we tried to do it. Uh, uh, with graphical, we really had to say it feels like 64, right? So here's the best way to do this. I'm going to try to set up some sort of uh, viewing party right here. So I'm going to put a box over all this crap. We're going to get this era out of here. There we go. I'm going to show you how to do this graph or algebraically. And again, when possible, algebraically is best. And when you're doing something algebraically, you just look for math that you know how to do. I happen to have taken algebra 2 before, so I happen to know that this binomial can be squared. And this becomes 16 times a quantity of 4 plus 4h plus h squared minus 
16 times 2 squared all over h, right? Now I happen to have taken pre-algebra, so I happen to know that 16 can be distributed in there. If you need to, a tutorial on distributing, my son is in fifth grade, he can help you out. 16 times 4, 64, plus 16 times 4h, 64h, 16 times h squared plus 16h squared, minus 16 times 2 squared, so 16 times 4, hey, it's still 64. And when we start out with the indeterminate form, at some point, if you're doing things algebraically, magic just starts to happen. And we see we've got a positive 64, minus 64, those crossy-crossy. We're left with 64h plus 16h squared over h. And you notice how all the terms have h in them? I know some of you are just going to start crossing off h's. That's okay if you do it right. But if you uh, don't, then it's not okay to start doing shortcuts. Some of you will probably want to do the factor out in h. So we've got h times quantity of 64 plus 16h all over h. And now the h's cross off of each other. And we're left with 64 plus 16h. Up until this point, if we plugged in the h value that we wanted, which again, remember, we want h to be negligibly large, so we want h to be equal to 0. Up until this point, if we had plugged in 0, we would have gotten that indeterminate form of 0 divided by 0. But now, if I evaluate this at h equals 0, by the way, if you've never seen that symbol before, a bar at the end with h equals 0 at the bottom, it means evaluate this expression for h equals 0. This now becomes 64 plus 16 times 0. 64 plus 0 gives me 64 feet per second. So good news, bad news. The good news is this is the best way to do it. We know that the answer is exactly 64 feet per second. The bad news is, and you probably noticed it, it's a little bit more difficult to do. You have to do some math, but you know, what else? We live. So now I'm going to use this uh, opportunity to go into limit notation. Excuse me. You guys learned what limit notation was at the end of the year last year. This is limit notation right here. If you've never seen me handwrite limits, I always handwrite limits in cursive. You would read this expression as the limit as x approach the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. Some quick notes here. x can be any variable, but that variable must match the variable inside the function. All right. C is going to be any number, and that can also be infinity. It can also be negative infinity. We talk about that in the next section. And L should be a number, or we can also have a phrase that's called does not exist. So that is possible as well. So now, for the first limit that I'm going to give you, uh, hands down 100%, the limit as x approaches 0 sine of x over x is equal to 1. You need to know that from here on out. That is something, put it in your notes. Reference it often. It's a, it's a limit you are aware of now, okay? Unfortunately, you don't have the skills to verify this numeric. You don't have the skills to verify this algebraically, but we can verify it numerically and uh, uh, graphically. I just grab my calculator, and I go into my y equals menu. Hey, I did some pre-work here, and I actually made sure that this expression was in my calculator. I do want to point out that when you put this into your calculator, you must make sure that you put in just the function. You can't put in limit. So you just put in the stuff after the limit. So sine of x over x is in my calculator. I happen to remember that I messed with my viewing window. So I'm going to go to zoom. And option 6 is zoom standard. I'm just going to zoom 6 it. And now I can see graphically where x equals 0, it looks like the height is at 1. Okay? And I can also go to my table 
and if I'm close to zero, I'm at one. So there we have verified graphically and numerically that again, the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x is equal to one. Now for some property, oh no, before we get to the properties of limits, I keep forgetting exactly what's gonna be on the next slide. Uh, so it's like a surprise for me every time. Uh, I do wanna emphasize for you guys that the limit of a function refers to the value that that function approaches, not the actual value of the function, if there is even a value of that function. And you can actually see I have a piecewise function graph up here for you where f of x equals half x plus one when x is less than two, it equals one when x equals two, and it's two when x is greater than two. And here's what the graph looks like. If you're still having trouble with piecewise functions, please, please, please come to office hours and beg me to explain piecewise functions to you. <clears throat> uh, here you can see really the only interesting thing that happens in this graph is this little, uh, we call it a discontinuity, where this filled in circle right down here is, and that's right at x equals two. So the really interesting part of this graph is the limit as x approaches two of f of x. The limit as x approaches two of f of x, and I'll show you exactly how I think about this in my, um, in my mind. I don't actually write this step out, but I do think about it, all right? So I imagine where x equals two by drawing this vertical line. And you might wanna do this while you're learning. That might make it a little bit easier. So deal. At that x equals two, I'm trying to figure out as I come in from what's called the left side and the right side, what height does that function approach? And that function, the height of it is where it's, it, where it's trying to get, not where it gets, but where it's trying to get, all right? So where it's trying to get is this open circle. I see a lot of people when they're learning this to go right for that closed circle because that's what we've told you for your whole life. But we're looking for where the graph is trying to get to, not where it gets, but where it's going to. So in this case, the height of where it's approaching is actually at a height of two, whereas the actual function value, f of two, that's the closed dot. That f of two is one. So it's the value that the function approaches, not the actual value that it attains. Now we're gonna talk about properties of limits. The properties of limits, that's right on page 61 and it bleeds over onto 62. You can see them right here. They're, it's really convoluted. L, M, C, and K are real numbers. Limit as X approaches C of F of X is equal to L. Limit as X approaches C of G of X is equal to M. Then the sum rule says the limit as X approaches C of F of X plus G of X is equal to L plus M. The things, <coughs> the things that you have to focus on here is all of the approach values are the same. So they're all X approach C. The L goes with F. The M goes with G. So if you're taking limit as x approaches c of f plus g, you can just take the actual limit values there. Now all of those, you got sum rule, difference rule, product rule, constant multiple rule, quotient rule, and on page 62, you even have the power rule. All of these in the book are really convoluted, a really convoluted way of just saying limits can be added, subtracted, multiplied with limits and with a constant, divided, and raised to a power. I happen to have some like nice tangible uh, examples of how um, in general uh, these can be tested on like, uh, how I've seen them on the AP test, how I've seen them uh, just in general college classes. It's something like this. Uh, you have some information right up here where the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is equal to 3. The limit as x approaches 2 of h of x is equal to 5. Then they ask you to find the limit as x approaches 2 of 2 g of x minus h of x. And I've seen some college professors require that you spell it out exactly like this. Limit it, you, you've got a difference in here, so you can bless it apart into two different limits, 2 g of x minus limit as x approach two of h of x. Since I've got a two in here, I can use the constant multiple rule to slide that two out in front. So this becomes two lim x approach two of g of x 
minus lim x approach 2 of h of x. And now since these expressions match exactly up here, we can just go right into 2 times 3 minus 5, which 2 times 3, I think that's 6 minus 5. The answer is 1 right here, all right? Honestly, nobody in the right mind actually does all of this. You see that the 2, 2, and 2 match. You're talking about 2g of x minus h of x. You know the limit as x approach 2 of g of x is 3. So really what you would do is you would just jump right down to this step if you're doing this informally. If there's some sort of way that you have to show your work, then you would have to do this. Lim x approach 2 of h of x over g of x. Let's just go, let's just cheat on this. 2, 2, 2, good. h of x, that's the 5 thirds. Answer's 5 thirds, all right? Uh, the decimals suck, so I'm not going to do that. X approach 2, yeah, 2 and 2, all right, cool. H of x, that's the 5. So this is equal to 5 squared plus 3, so 5 squared, 25 plus 3, 28. That next problem down there, way too hard for us to do right now. But there's, there's that theorem, all right? And now we have another theorem. Theorem 2 is on page 62. Let's go back to my doc cam so you guys can see it. There's theorem 2. If f of x is a polynomial function and c is any real number, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. If f of x and g of x are polynomials and c is any real number, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x is equal to f of c over g of c, as long as g of c is not equal to 0. Uh, that's a convoluted way of saying if you're finding the limit of a polynomial function as x approaches c, just evaluate the function for c. If you're finding the limit of a rational function as x approaches c, as long as the denominator not 0 at c, then evaluate the function for c. This is what's called direct substitution. And you can see right up here, I actually have some direct substitution problems. My recommendation for you guys is anytime you start a limit problem, start with direct substitution. I see limit as x approaches 5 of x minus 4 to the 2,000th power times x. That looks scary because I got the 2,000th power. But really, I just try plugging in 5. 5 minus 4 to the 2,000th power times 5. 5 minus 4 is 1. 1, and one to the anythingth power is 1. 1 times 5 gives me 5. See how easy that problem is? Or we can talk about this. This is a rational expression. The first thing I check in my rational expression, if I plug in 3 into the denominator, am I going to get 0? Because I can only evaluate this as long as the denominator is not 0. 3 minus 2, that's 1. Okay, cool. We good. So we just go and we direct substitute. 3 squared plus 4 times 3 plus 4 over 3 minus 2. 3 minus 2 is 1. Uh, 3 squared, 9 plus 12 plus 4. 9 plus 12, 21 plus 4. 25 sound about right, right? 9 plus 12, yeah, 25, All right? Or that one that I said before was way too hard for us to do. Guess what? Ain't too hard for us to do now, and it's a polynomial. If I have a polynomial expression inside my limit notation, all I have to do is direct substitute. Notice how it's x approach 1, negative 1, sorry. I got 2 times negative 1 squared minus 7 times negative 1 plus 9. Negative 1 squared is 1 times 2 gives me 2. Uh, minus 7 times negative 1 gives me plus 7 plus 9. 2 and 7, 9 plus 9, 18. So always try direct substitution because if it works, you have your answer. What happens if it doesn't work? Well, then you have to look for something else. Wait, wait, pretend like I didn't ask that. What happens if it doesn't work? <laughs> I meant I didn't ask that. So it's, it's just up here now. So I would recommend try direct substitution on this. All three of them, just do direct substitution. I'll wait. No, I'm just getting positive and, uh, and then I'll come back. Because right now I got negative one squared. That's one, minus one, zero. Divided by negative one plus one. That's zero. That indeterminate form. If you find an indeterminate form at any point in your problem, that's when you know that you have to do some extra work. If it's not an indeterminate form, but you still can't evaluate it, then there's some other tricks that I'll show you uh, some other time. Not right now.
But here, we're just looking for some sort of trick. One thing that I do want to point out, you can only drop the limit notation here. Notice how I don't have the limit notation in the second expression. That is because I did the direct substitution. At this point, I'm going back to this expression, maybe do some math on it, but I'm going to go back to the time before which I did the direct substitution. So the limit notation has to still be there. It seems that whenever we have elementary calculus students, they always hate to write the limit notation, but whatever, I don't care. You must do it. You will lose points if you don't. All right, so I've got limit as x approaches negative 1. Now look at this numerator, and I happen to know that's the difference of squares. So I've got x plus 1 times x minus 1 in the numerator. In the denominator, I've just got x plus 1. Now I just look for stuff that I can do. Oh, hey, I can cross off that x plus 1. In this next step, I am not going to plug in the negative 1 because I'm still doing the, the more abstract math the, the non arithmetic -y kind of math. I don't like how that equal sign looks. So we're going to back up. And we're going to try to not drag our finger over it. So now I've got limit as x approaches negative 1. Again, I'm not de subbing yet, so I don't drop the limit notation. Basically, if x is still in the problem, lim better still be there. And now, at this point, I'm going to de sub. So I've got negative 1 minus 1. Notice how I dropped off the x's, so I drop off the limit notation. And then this answer ends up being negative 2. All right? Next one, I still try to do my, uh, my, my direct substitution. This might give you some, some huge difficulties, but we might remember that sine squared is really just sine of x squared. It's not sine squared of x. That's just how we write it so that we don't have to put these stupid parentheses every single time uh, so that it doesn't look like x is being squared. So I happen to know if I was to direct substitute in this one, sine of 0 is 0. 0 squared gives me 0. Divided by plugging in 0 for x, I get 0. So it's an indeterminate form again. But I don't see anything that I can do on this. So I'm just going to like make some stuff up here and try to find something else. I got now the limit as x approaches 0 of, well, sine squared, that just means sine of x times sine of x all over x, right? Now I can do some magic here, so a little bit of, little bit of magic shuffling. I can use the product rule. I can change this since I've got a product right in here. I got sine of x times sine of x over x. I can change this into a product of two limits. Limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x times limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x. Well, I happen to know this value right here. That's d subable sine of 0 times ugh. This one right here, that's hard. I don't know what that is. If only, if only somebody, somebody in this world, if somebody had told you what the limit as x approaches 0, sine of x over x is, I don't know if anybody would have been that nice. I was that nice to you guys. I told you what the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is. I told you that that is equal to 1. I'm sure at some point I told you about the zero product property that zero times anything is zero. So this value, the limit as x approaches zero of sine squared of x over x is equal to zero. And again, notice that I'm not de-subbing here, so I'm keeping limit notation. Don't drop your limit notation halfway through the problem, because that is Chabada. We look at this last one. We try to de-sub. Nothing to sub in at the top, so it's just one over negative one plus one is zero. Yikes. That's not an indeterminate form. I teach you how to evaluate this limit next section, but we could also do this using our fancy schmancy graphing calculator. In fact, if we go into the y equals menu, you will see on my calculator, I've actually already put in the expression of 1 over x plus 1 into y3 right, y3 right here, 1 over 1 plus x. And if we remember from trig precalc, we actually know what happens at a value of negative 1. If you can't cancel off a, a factor of 0 in the denominator, 
this ends up just being a vertical asymptote. Let's just look at the graph. You can actually see from the left, graph go down. From the right, graph go up. So this is actually your first case of limit does not exist because from the left and the right, again, those are technical terms that I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, since they go different directions, the limit does not exist. At x equals negative one, it exists everywhere else. Right, let's take that off and let's go, ooh, here. We have something weird called a right-hand limit and a left-hand limit. We've got our first expression up there can be read as the limit of f as x approaches c from the right. We've got the left-hand limit would be read the left the limit of f as the limit of f as x approaches c from the left. I hope you guys can see the difference between those two uh, expressions. And it comes from this plus and this minus. If the plus and the minus are be, are after the, uh, uh, the, the number, then they are, they are for the uh, determining whether it's the right-hand limit or the left-hand limit. If you're really confused as to why the plus is the right and the minus is the left, it all goes down to this uh, really complicated uh, tool called a number line with C at the center. Numbers to the right, although my arrow is pointing to the left there, the numbers to the right of C. Those are the more positive numbers. And the numbers to the left, those are the more negative numbers. So hopefully that'll help you remember which one's the left-hand limit and which, one, which one's the right-hand limit. But we have another theorem, and that theorem is actually in your textbook. It's on page 64. It's theorem three. It's right, right here. It's kind of math jargony. Uh, a function f of x has a limit as x approaches c if and only if the right hand and left hand limits at c exist and are equal in symbols. Limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to L if and only if the limit as x approaches uh, c from the left equals the limit as x approaches c from the right, uh, which is equal to L. So then the limit exists and it is L. All right. We could also say that in non-gobbledygook type speak, and it looks like this. The limit of f as x approaches c exists if and only if the limits from both left and the right exist as the same number. I guess that is pretty much the uh, word way that the book put it. But here we have another piecewise function. And I would say there's actually one, two, three, four, five. There's five interesting points here. And by interesting points, I mean weird stuff happens. Like at one, there's this thing that happens. There are some technical terms for what those are called. This is technically called a jump discontinuity, but you don't need to worry about that until we get to continuity. This right here is called a removable discontinuity, but you don't need to worry about that until we get to continuity. And this is called a corner. And those are all just interesting points. Here, the beginning of the domain and the end of the domain, those are all also interesting. Everything else is just kind of kind of weak and uh, the limits are really easy to evaluate, so uh, they're just not that interesting to me. So at x equals one, we're gonna try to evaluate four different things. We're gonna try to evaluate the limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x. We're gonna try to evaluate the limit as x approaches one from the right of f of x. We're going to try to find out what f of 1 is, and we're going to try to find out what is the limit as x approaches 1, period, of f of x. So those are four separate questions. And in order to answer these four separate questions, again, like I showed you before, you can draw this vertical line so it gives a nice visual for you at x equals negative x equals positive one, sorry, not negative one. Uh, and that way you can actually give a nice little dividing part here. First one is left because we've got this neg this minus after the one and coming in from the left, that's right here. Now notice when I'm evaluating the left-hand limit, I don't have to go like way over here to evaluate it because there's, there's really nothing over here. I'm just going locally, close to one, but approaching it. So looking at that part, it looks like that function is decreasing as it gets to one, and it's approaching the x-axis. So on the x-axis, the height would be zero. Again, 
as I'm approaching it, I want to figure out what is the height, what's the upy downy that the graph is trying to get to. The plus means the other side. So coming in from the other side. Again, I don't care about the stuff that happens over here. I just care about close to one and coming into one. Coming into one is a horizontal line. Let me get up close there for you guys. Horizontal line, so the height's not really changing. As I get to one, it's approaching a value of one. F of one, that is just where it's colored in. What is the height of the dot colored in at x equals one? It's at a height of one, where it's colored in. I will tell you this fourth question, what is the limit as x equals one? Oh, sorry, what is the limit as x approaches one of f of x? To answer that, I'm going to completely ignore number three. All right, number three is correct, but I'm putting it out of my mind. So let me take away that x because that might confuse people and make them think that it's the wrong answer. But here, to answer this fourth question, I'm going to look at the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. Is the left-hand limit the same as the right-hand limit? Zero and one. Is they same? No? You say they are not? Okay, cool. If they are not the same, the limit does not exist. Try to answer the same questions at two. Limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x. And do them while I'm writing them down. If you need more time, you can pause the uh, video and do them then. If I'm being honest with you guys, the way that I would do this problem, I would do the first two and then the last one. And then I would do the third one. Because really, again, the third one does not make any difference for uh, all the other problems. So again, here, I'm talking about two this time. Left-hand limit, I'm going toward, toward two. Horizontal line, flat at one. Going from left-hand uh, limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x is equal, sorry, limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x is equal to one. Limit as x approaches two from the right. Well, that's over here. It's going down, and it's going to a height of one. All right, cool, 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 cool. Are these two the same? I'm basically just asking, does one equal one? And the answer is absolutely yes, it does. And since, it, since these two limits equal each other, the handed limits equal, the limit as a whole is one. Now let's go back to this one. This just means, where is it colored in? It is colored in at two. F of two equal two. All right. So just to show you, here's those answers. Left hand limit, right hand limit, F of two. Boom, yeah. We're gonna try to do the same thing at three. So I, what we had four different questions. Limit as x approaches three from the left of f of x. Limit as x approaches three from the right of f of x. f of three and limit as x approach three of f of x. And this is actually a very special case. So if we look at three, and again, if you don't have them yet, pause it, try to answer them. Some of you are going to just like tear through these answers. Some of you are going to struggle a lot. Coming in from the left, lines going up, it's going to a height of two. Hey, look, coming in from the right, it's going same place. It's also two. Are these two the same? What's that you say? Yes, they are. Okay, then this is also two. Where's it colored in? At the exact same place. Because these two are equal to each other, this is something called a continuous function. We get into that in continuity. That's later this chapter. And just to show you I'm not fibbing, here's all the answers at three. And again, I did tell you that there were two other interesting points, beginning of domain and end of domain. So let's just answer, let's just answer the four for the beginning of the domain. Limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x. 
limit as x approaches 0 from the right of f of x. That's not the one I wanted. Third one I wanted was f of 0, and then I wanted limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. All right? So we're talking about at x equals 0 in this case. And you may be looking to the left of 0, and you may be in like, what the, what, what the devil? There's nothing over here. If there's nothing over here, then that means that the limit can't exist because the function is not defined. So if the function is not defined, I guess we technically don't have to put equals does not exist. We just put d n e. That is shorthand for does not exist. I'm pretty sure any college professor will accept d n e. I will accept d n e. If you're ever doing anything formal, you're probably going to want to write out it does not exist. Now coming in from the right, oh, it does exist. That handed limit does exist. We're going to a, a height of one coming in from the right. Now let's get down to the last problem. Does this equal this? Well, my bad handwriting makes it look like this spells one, but we remember this is a D. So it's D N E. D N E is not the same as one. So I guess, again, technically we don't have to say equals D N E, but this does not exist. Uh, where's it colored in? It's colored in at one. All right, cool. All right. Ooh. Everybody's favorite party is called the Sandwich Theorem. I would recommend writing down the Sandwich Theorem. The Sandwich Theorem states that if g of x is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to h of x for all x not equal to c in some interval about c and the limit as x approaches c is equal to g of x, which is equal to... Sorry, the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to the limit as x approaches c of h of x is equal to L. Then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is L. I love this theorem. It is so cool. But I often find that my students hate it because it's kind of hard to uh, imagine. Basically what you have is you have a lower boundary and you have an upper boundary. G is your lower boundary. That's going to be my left arm. H is your upper boundary. That's going to be my right arm. As long as f of x is somewhere in between my two arms, somewhere in between there, hopefully we get to a point where the limit of g of x is equal to the limit of h of x. So that would mean come smashing down together. And that would mean that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is somewhere in between my arms, which can only be my two arms. I'm going to try to show you guys an example of that. I'm just going to make up an example. We got the limit as x approaches, let's go with 0, of x squared sine of 1 over x. And often people ask me, how do I know that I'm going to be using sandwich theorem? Well, I use sandwich theorem if I have to have two pieces of bread. And the way that I know that I'm going to have to have two pieces of bread is if I'm dealing with a function that has a maximum and a minimum. The maximum and a minimum is bred from this oscillating function. What I'm trying to get at here is most often, I'm not going to say guaranteed that this is the only time you're going to use sandwich theorem, but you're going to use sandwich theorem when you're dealing with oscillating functions like sine or cosine. Uh, at this point in your intelligence life, uh, we'll tell you if you're using sandwich theorem, all right? So I don't know what happens if I plug in zero here. So I've got 1 divided by 0. 1 divided by 0, zero is a no-no. So I don't know what this is, but I do happen to know that for any value of 1 over x, sine of 1 over x does have a minimum and a maximum, because this is just some sort of input. Sine is always less than or equal to its maximum of 1. Sine is always greater than or equal to negative one. So it's somewhere in between there. So now we're going to do some fancy math. I see that I've got x squared sine of 1 over x up here. I want to make this say x squared sine of 1 over x. So I can multiply it by x squared. It's still scary in the middle there. But I remember algebra 2, if I multiply by x squared over here, I got to multiply it on the left hand side. So I've got x squared times negative 1. And if I multiply it on these sides, to maintain the inequality, I have to multiply it over here as well, right? Still confusing as heck, but a little bit less so, because now I know that this 
is negative x squared, less than equal. x squared sine of 1 over x, less than equal x squared. Again, still horrible. But what I now have, I now have this expression is the same as the function in the limit notation. The sandwich theorem now allows me to just write the limit notation in front of each of these expressions. So let me show you what that looks like. I now have the limit as x approaches, and I need to see what the approach value was. It was 0. So I've got the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared less than or equal to, I'm just putting the same exact limit notation in front of every single side. less than or equal to limit as x approaches 0 of x squared. So again, that this line up here, the only difference for the last line is writing limit in front of each of the sides of the inequality. How does that help me? I don't know. Because I still am having a huge problem with knowing what the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine of 1 over x is. But I do happen to know that it is between two numbers. I am now going to try to evaluate this expression and this expression to find my minimum value and my maximum value of this limit. Direct substitution, negative 0 squared. That's 0. Okay, direct substitution, 0 squared. Well, that's 0. And now, again, this is too complicated for me to solve, but I happen to know that it's somewhere between 0 and 0, inclusive of 0. If you don't understand how obvious this statement is yet, let me draw a number line to explain it to you. Number line was 0, right in the center, right? Zero right in the center, or equal to, that means all of my endpoints are dots. Let's go up here so you guys can actually see it. It's somewhere in between zero and zero. I'm going to shade everything in between zero. Therefore, the limit as x approaches zero of x squared sine of 1 over x is going to be equal to zero. Okay. I've got a nice little picture here. Uh, there, it's written out in words, typed out, I guess you might say. But here is the, the, the nice picture of the sandwich there. The blue picture there is y equals x squared. The green graph there is y equals negative x squared. The squiggly squiggly is x squared times sine of 1 over x. You can graph this in your calculator using the same scaling here. And you can actually see in this that the blue is the top bread. The green is the bottom bread. And that squiggledy is the meat, or if you're a vegetarian, lettuce or whatever. Uh, that has to be in between that bread. It never goes outside of that bread. And it kind of squeezes in in the middle there. That's why the, an alternate name for this theorem is called the squeeze theorem. Okay. And it sounds like my wife is texting me because I'm doing this after school. So this is like a full hour after I should be home. Uh, here are some practice problems. These are probably some problems that we're going to have to go over in class. You might want to look at them, try them out, but we will have much more practice in class. So uh, this was fun. Let's do this again sometime. And I hope next time I make a video, I don't have to record it four times. <laughs>